Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for showing up early in the morning today, listening to me. Okay. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, how good, bad, or ugly our assumptions are as far as building modeling is. And this is mostly coming from code provisions. Um, I have like 40 slides to talk about. I hope that I can go through them very fast. The first slide, I'm bringing up a few the front pages of these codes and guidelines. You see ASC 7, you see ASC 41, you see design, uh, tall building design guidelines from Los Angeles and San Francisco, and you see the um, two performance-based design guidelines. In all of these, either of them, these documents themselves or their surrogates suggest ways to model your buildings. And this is for engineers. And engineers put their faith into these models and do their engineering work. We want to use instrumented building data to see how good these assumptions uh, can be. As far as today's concern, my focus would be on two things. Number one, the things that we accomplished at UC Irvine, and specifically using instrumented building data to see how good, bad, or ugly damping and period assumptions are in ASC 7. Also, we're going to look into the provisions for accidental torsion. Lastly, I want to talk about the future directions that we are uh, moving forward in, and I hope that I can finish early, that I can listen to your comments. One of the areas that we are, going, we are doing research right now, actually is coming from one of the comments that I received about a year, year and a half ago on a similar topic, so it's really good that I can finish early, I can uh, listen to what you have to say. Um, one question. Do people sitting in the back hear me? Yes. Louder? No, you're good. Yeah, I can go louder. All right. Um, slide showing uh, what ASC 7 has in terms of damping and um, period. There is an equation. The, work, the, the equation is coming from the work that Chopra and Goel did late in the 90s. And given the lateral load resisting system, you can come up with an estimate of period. It is a low bar, engineers know it, but that's what we have to work with. In terms of damping, if you're using spectral analysis, 5% is the way to go because you're not bringing any sort of energy dissipation in the structure. If you are using performance-based design guidelines, which is asking you to may have building models that can incorporate nonlinear action, you, get a, you have to use less value for equivalent damping. In terms of accidental torsion, um, there are two pictures here. The, the picture on the right-hand side is a, picture, is a picture of a building that kind of shows that it has irregularity in it. Accidental torsion with these kind of buildings is kind of a dwarfed by the inherent torsion. We're not going to talk about these. We're talking about accidental torsion in symmetric buildings, and the source of this accidental torsion is um, uh, uncertainty in the stiffness of the lateral load resisting lines or the distribution uh, uncertainty in the distribution of mass of each floor. Um, we are blessed uh, to work with CS SMIP and by that sense the California Department of Conservation. We receive funding from them for the work that I'm going to present today plus they have tons of data that we're utilizing for our work. I have a couple of slides talking about their data. This is basically showing how much their data has increased past 2000 in the number of, number of events that they're picking up. And the next slide shows where is the intensity, or be, be, better said, where is the magnitude of these ground motions that they're picking up. For the work that I'm presenting today, this is ideal. The models that we are using are not tainted much by the nonlinear action of the buildings. So we are relatively confident that um, the work that we do is reasonable. Coming from the research who have done the work, that's big. Um, moving forward, usually the um, CSMIP data is formed in their database. It's hard to access uh, their database uh, in an automatic way. We have downloaded all their data, and students at UCI are on a daily basis collecting all the data that they collect from their instrumented buildings. Um, let's talk about what folks in the past have done. Uh, and this is mostly the part about modal damping and uh, period. Uh, estimating uh, period goes back to the work that Joel and Chopra did. Uh, Goel and Chopra did in 1997 and 1998. These are the references to their papers and the pictures that you see here. Can you see this? 
No, you cannot. Anyway, um, the two, these two uh, plots show where is their suggested equation that ended up in the code for estimating building period. It's all based on um, low amplitude seismic events and low rise and mid rise buildings. Talking about damping, and going back to the work that Satake did for Japanese buildings, and in this one particularly, you can see this exponential drop in first mode damping. Longer the period, less damping, and it gets almost to the level of 1% for buildings whose period is about five seconds. It's the same for steel and mo uh, concrete buildings, although that for concrete buildings it was a little bit higher. Recent work on this, it's the work that Bernal did and later the work that Miranda and Cruz did at Stanford University, they focused on tall buildings. And this is a slide from their work. Their estimate of damping is a little bit higher than what Satake suggested, but it's still in the order of two to three percent. Um, let's take a look at the building with a height of like 200 meters, something in the order of 50 story building. The estimate of damping is around two percent for steel and a little bit higher for 3% for, for concrete buildings. Their work is the basis for the TBI guidelines in San Francisco and in Los Angeles. Now coming to the work that we have done, i first like to introduce the demographic of um, our buildings. The slide shows number of stories in the horizontal axis. The vertical axis shows the number of buildings in this plot, the plot on the left hand side, and the right hand side plot shows the number of events. It's a pretty rich database, and it has all sorts of lateral road resisting systems. We have steel moment frames, reinforced concrete moment frames, and shear walls. Using this data, we came up with equations for damping and period, and the work is under review in a journal publication in Spectra. What I have for you today is a couple of um, pictures from that paper. The pictures on the left-hand side, the two top and bottom, are uh, period estimates for steel moment frames, and the bottom one is for reinforced concrete moment frames. We think that the code estimate for period is on the low bar, and the values can be a tad high, and we have equations for that. What I want you guys to focus on, on damping, is the large variation in the estimate of damping that we get from various system identification techniques. The prediction interval is very large, and the estimates are in median happens about 3-4%. We have a suggestion how to move away from modeling all the energy dissipation in the structure through a viscous mode. In the future direction, we are suggesting to have a damping element model that is a combination of a viscous damper and a Coulomb damper. It takes friction. I'm going to show how we calibrated the results and how nice the results look like. Um, comparing these damping results with other researchers, this is a very busy slide. Uh, what I want you guys to focus on are the black lines, which is coming from our research. The dots are results from system IDs. And the color lines are the work from other researchers. Specifically, the work by Satake is shown with the magenta color. You can see that it's really low. The next one above that is the work by Bernal and uh, Miranda and Cruz, which is still estimates damping a little bit lower than what we estimated. We looked into the where the source of difference coming from, especially for the Cruz and Miranda work, and it all comes down to one, the unimportance of first mode damping for buildings who have a long period. Changing the damping, uh, viscous damping value wouldn't change the reconstructed results. And given that everything is based on system identification, the system identification technique would not pick up those differences. And the other one is we don't know um, uh, the di system identification techniques, each one of them have different estimates of damping by themselves. And you can see the same thing for reinforced concrete buildings. Uh, so all together, and this concludes the first part um, of our work at UCI, and this is basically talking about the damping and period. Uh, we have equations for T and C. Uh, some of our equations show that damping is amplitude dependent, especially for reinforced concrete buildings. It's not amplitude dependent for steel buildings. And for tall buildings, the first mode damping shouldn't be your major um, uh, point of argument, uh, as it was a few years back. 
Um, talking a little bit about system identification techniques um, to make this huge topic in like one minute. Basically, you're taking chunks of data from your red um, accelerometers, you're stacking them together, making this Hankel matrix, and then you're doing a, a singular value decomposition to come with eigenvalues. Depending on how, how, what, what's the length of the chunk that you pick and you stack, and how many eigenvalues you're going to pick for your system ID, you get different results. And the results are going to look something like these plots. The left-hand side shows frequency, the color shows the estimated frequency, and the right-hand side shows the equivalent damping for the second mode of a tall building. Horizontal axis shows number of eigenvalues that you picked, and the vertical axis shows how much was the length of the data that you stacked from your uh, collected data. The results show looks very stable. There is only one color that you see that is dominant in this picture. If I do this for that building but different modes, the first column is mode one, second column is mode two, and third column is mode three. Top row is frequency, low row is damping. We can see that second and third mode is identified very well. The first mode looks a little bit fuzzy. If you use different system identification <coughs> techniques, each one of them will give you different results. So what we did was that we combined all of these results, looked into the maximum likelihood, and we generated a plot that looks like this. Horizontal axis shows frequency, the vertical axis shows the population of identified frequency on the horizontal axis, and the yellow columns are showing where all the data converge together. We use a separate frequency domain system identification technique whose results are shown here with a black line that shows what are the superior modes, and this is the one at the very right-hand side, and what are the real modes. So this is why um, I think that our uh, results are relatively robust. This concludes the first part of my presentation, moving forward to uh, accidental torsion. So as I um, mentioned early on, we are focusing on symmetric buildings, the buildings that you see on the left-hand side. Again, coming back to the work that was done in the past, earlier work goes back to Chopra and De La Yera. They used also CSMIP data and they came up with a plot similar to what you see on the picture. Horizontal axis shows the ratio of lateral to torsional uh, period of uh, building. The lower the value, that means that the building is torsionally flexible. The vertical axis shows effective eccentricity. Basically means you need to put the base shear with this level of eccentricity to the side of the center of mass that you can replicate the results of more sophisticated analysis, in their case, spectral analysis. What we have done is that we have used multi-degree freedom systems and we have used time history analysis for our work. Another work that worth mentioning in this line is the ATC123 uh, who looked into collapse as their um, performance measure. Uh, the work by Debak and co-workers, basically I have mentioned an item at the bottom here that they think that for uh, buildings that do not have asymmetry or for um, uh, accidental torsion is not important for buildings that do not have much asymmetry. So now coming to our work, we took CSMIP data. You cannot find many buildings that are um, symmetric in their database. So we resorted to a hybrid approach. We generated a bunch of analytical models. These are analytical models that we are hoping that can replicate um, what you see out there in the society as our buildings. We have, this is the plan view of our building. The, uh, the period in the two horizontal directions in the translational mode is identical, they're similar. By changing the direction of the, uh, the distance between the walls or the frames in the horizontal direction, we're changing the torsional characteristic of the building. And by doing this, we're changing that omega parameter. The picture on this side shows the pushover of our four, eight, 12, and 20-story buildings, and these results match very well um, similar work archetypes that was used to assess the collapse capacity of steel moment resisting frames. So we think that our models are representing buildings that are out there. I have two slides to show that this is a fact. The first slide is this one. You see 
black and gray colors. Black and gray are median and 84 percentile coming from our analytical work. The vertical axis shows a parameter called alpha 2, which is the magnification in displacement response of a floor due to accidental torsion. Horizontal axis shows that omega value. The lower the value, the building is more torsionally sensitive. As you can see, the buildings that are torsionally sensitive have a larger magnification due to their, um, due to application of ground motions in, in their displacement response. There are dots on this picture. These are the results that we received from data uh, on CS Smith. As you can see, the data the, the cloud of the data and where we have our median and dispersion fall relatively on top of each other. There's another slide that I'd like to show, and it's this one. This is going a little bit deeper. This is only looking at eight-story buildings. So I only have eight-story. The colors are green, um, red, and black, and magenta. And the horizon and the plots show similar plots that you saw before. Vertical axis is magnification due to accidental torsion. Horizontal axis shows the omega value, and the results from system ID and data collected from CSMIP are superimposed onto the box plots which is coming from our simulations. Again, the results are in the ballpark of our simulation models. So all of that, looking into accident, uh, what is the effective eccentricity? I have four plots here. Each plot represents one building height, 4, 8, 12, and 20. The vertical axis is the effective eccentricity, similar to what Chopra and De La Era suggested. Horizontal axis is omega. You can imagine that uh, the way that we found effective eccentricity is that we moved the base shear that much to the side of the center of mass that it can replicate the magnification in response from our analysis, from our simulations, considering that there is uncertainty in the stiffness of the lateral load resisting systems. Altogether, we can see that 5% damping, a 5% effective, uh, 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 the 5% rule for accidental torsion falls relatively good where the median results are. If you're seeking higher confidence bands, you need to go and increase that 5%. Um, I have maybe one or two more minutes. I want to close by what we think are future directions. I mentioned earlier that uh, equivalent viscous damping is not a good way to incorporate uh, energy dissipation in buildings in places, uh, in sources other than uh, structural components going in doing their nonlinear action. What we suggest is to use a damping element similar to what you see in the building. It looks like a, a a brace frame, but it has two dampers on it. It has a viscous damper and it has a friction damper. We calibrated these results. You can see the three stories that we did the calibration for. The reconstructed results and the results read from da uh, data from CSMIP match very nicely together. We can also plot floor spectra. Even on floor spectra level, they look very nice. So we think that's the way forward. We have calibrated um, these elements uh, using the data that we collected from CSMIP. And right now, we are making uh, more general equations that an engineer can use building properties to come up with these damping elements to use in their building models. Uh, the other one that we are looking into is try to find out how much is diaphragm flexibility. We always make assumptions that diaphragms are stiff, um, are rigid. Using the data, we can see what is the um, how good that assumption is. And uh, finally, the work that we're doing right now is try to use the seismic data and validate our um, uh, bridge models. Uh, very similar to what we did for buildings. There was a work that was funded through Caltrans and Pierre, ET, myself, and uh, Khaled worked on it in the past few years. We have a series of models for ordinary bridges. We have made some enhancement on these models. We want to make sure that these models are uh, reasonable. So with that, I'm going to skip the last slide. Thank you very much for listening to my 100 mile per hour presentation. <laughs> I'll take your comments.